Salamat Po Pastor, Murderside Baptist Church. I'm glad to be back. Very, very glad. I hope you had a great afternoon. Had a wonderful time this morning. I think especially when you all filed out and said goodbye. Now, that doesn't mean you were happy to leave church. Now, I'm talking about the grace that you showed, your kindness, and, uh, and your support uh, for, what we, for what we're doing uh, for the Lord in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Uh, I would like to, you know what I want to do? I don't want to go on so far that I, I, I don't pray because I'm, I'm so full that I've, I, we have to pray first. So let's, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing as pastor has already prayed. Uh, we ask that we would have your blessing. This morning was wonderful and you blessed, but we need you now. And so please undertake. As a great preacher once said, thank God he undertakes for me. And that's what you do for us. You undertake for us. And the Holy Spirit is our teacher who guides us to all truth. We pray he would do that tonight. We ask that uh, as we think on the word of God and we think about the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, that our fires would be lit, that we would be burdened to give more and more of ourselves to the one who gave his all for us. We ask for the, I, I ask, Father, again, for the Holy Spirit's fullness, for the wisdom of God that you have planted in my heart, that what comes forth from my mouth would be your words, would be just the, just the food that you have for your dear sheep here at Riverside Baptist, here in the church and watching live stream. We, we cannot proceed without your blessing in our hearts, we wrestle with you because we must have your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> well, you heard a little bit from my wife a couple minutes on the video this morning, and uh, you heard her testimony. Uh, she got saved when she was young. She did her own thing for a number of years, but God did not quit on her, and God spared her and um, worked in her heart, brought her back to himself, and has been preparing her for a life with me. And I have been prepared for a life with her at this time of my life. And um, uh, I, I rejoice in what God has allowed us to do. Uh, the mission work we do, if you, <clears throat> many, 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 many of you got prayer cards this morning. If you didn't get one, I've got some left. But on the prayer card, I have the word outreach. O, open schools. We help, and this is not in any particular order of importance, it's in the order of the word outreach. Okay, all right. I, I, if I scramble the word outreach, it will make no sense to you. So we start with O. Uh, part of what I've been doing these five years, uh, excuse me, these, it, yes, it has been five years, these five missions trips to Vietnam and Philippines, five to Philippines, two to Vietnam, is to help pastors open schools teach them what to do, um, Christian schools, that is. Um, uplift believers, that's really, that's part of the job of an evangelist, to edify the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's what we're, that's what we do. To teach teachers, I do teacher training. I've been in the field of education for 45 years. Now, do I know everything about education? No, nobody knows everything about anything. No, nobody does. Uh, but God has given me a lot of experiences and so pastors and principals ask me to share with their teachers and future teachers ways that they can become better teachers. Our relay funds. This, I want to tell you something. This may not sound like a scriptural word. The word is fun when it comes to giving. So let's substitute that for a spiritual, with a spiritual word, joy. But I wish I had learned how to find the joy of giving sooner in life. <clears throat> I have it now. But it's, it's fun to give. It's a joy to give. Um, and uh, I, I just would run out of examples. I'm not the world's greatest giver, but I want to tell you, I have the greatest giver, him. And uh, I would just encourage you to give out of a heart of joy and thanksgiving and love when you give. And then giving becomes fun. It becomes, it becomes real joy uh, to do that. But what happens is that when people give us funds, 
for our missions trips, we designate money to give to pastors, to the needy, when we go to the Philippines and when we go to Vietnam, which we will be doing, God willing. But it's, we don't go to churches expecting to receive anything. We go expecting to give. That's, that's the joy we have. People give us money so that we can go to more places and then share, and it, it's, it is a joy. Pastors don't expect it. When we say goodbye, pastor, we have a gift for you. There are people who have given to our missions trip and they want to share with you. And uh, we were at a church uh, in 2022. They were missing some things that are just basic for us. Printer, just a printer, some office, office um, machines. When we went back there in January, we went to the church, the pastor pointed. He said, the money that you gave, it's right over there. And so when you give to missions, dear people at Riverside Baptist, when you give, you are blessing. You're blessing people on the mission field. And you don't see it, but I'm here to tell you, I do. So I'm letting you know. We, this is one thing that we do with missions money that is given to us, is we get to share it with other people. Uh, these pastors, many of them have feeding ministries. Every week, they have a feeding ministry. They have an outreach for the community. They have food, and they have the gospel. Food for the body, food for the soul. And so, uh, often t- uh, pastors have told me, oh, our feeding ministry, we want to do more. We will take this and use this for the feeding ministry. Um, and then we evangelize communities. We work, uh, we com- we work with uh, public schools. Public schools are, they welcome, many, many, many welcome the gospel to be given to their, their schools. This morning I had one picture. There was a public school I went to. There were 1,200 students and teachers here in the gospel. We have all kinds of opportunities to do community outreach. Reach. Uh, uh, Jezza is going back to her parents' home province uh, the first part of March. We did some work in January. God just did some things, double what we were expecting, double. So she's going back to the public school that we went to. She's going to make another visit there. And then she's going to have a community outreach in the neighborhood using her parents' uh, re- uh, retirement home isn't done yet, but it's enough to be a meeting place. And so there will be an outreach there. Then there is a woman in the neighborhood who is a believer. She wants a Bible study. She wants to lead a Bible study. She doesn't know how. So Jezza is going to teach her in the two weeks she's there how to lead a Bible study. And there aren't a lot of churches in the neighborhood, but we can at least get a Bible study started. We can at least do that. And who knows what God will do after that. So we are not exactly starting churches or starting a church, but Who knows what God will do through the outreach? Uh, And we're just giving the gospel out, and we're reaching out. So we evangelize communities. We aid ministries in which uh, I just go to a pastor and say, how can we be a help to you? Um, And that's what I've done all my life. I've not been a senior pastor, but my whole philosophy has been, pastor, what can I do to help you? How can I help you? How can I ease your load? And that's, that's our philosophy. Council leaders, pastors and principals, um, people involved in the church talk to Jez and me after services or they'll have meetings with us and we just, we, we try to give them some help and some, some counsel. And then uh, I teach classes. <clears throat> I was asked by, by a Bible college to give about a three hour session on what is biblical counseling. Now that's easy to do in three hours. I'm joking. <laughs> but he said, would you just give our people the foundation, the basics of, of the philosophy of biblical counseling. So I had a chance to do that in, uh, in a Bible college. And then I, on this last trip, I had another pastor who has a Bible college. It's a large church, large outreach. He said, let's, let's talk about doing, doing something in our Bible college as, as well. The opportunities keep happening. And the labors are few. Pastor mentioned pray for this will this will encourage you, all right? On, one of, on my living room table, I have a prayer card for a couple who are going to 
Indonesia. A new couple, a young couple. Yes. So when you pray that the Lord would send forth laborers into his harvest, God hears. What God needs also is willing hearts. People are just willing to go. I want to tell you, Jezza and I, are no, we are nobody special. All we are are two Christians who have said, God, we surrender to you. Use us. We don't belong to ourselves. I was sharing with pastor's wife earlier. I said, I, said, I called her Brittany. Okay, you just have to understand. Okay. You may call her Mrs. Pastor, whatever you call her. But I said, Brittany, um, do you belong to yourself? Who do you belong to? We are about with the price, aren't we? We are. We don't belong to ourselves. And uh, something that I, I have in the message tonight, but I, I just want to say right now, um, our lives do not consist of what we have. Luke 12, 15. Our lives consist of what we give. Ultimately, to him. And that's really where the joy comes to. Um, so I would like you to turn, please, to... Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And we say, oh, I've already heard messages on 12, 1. I've heard it. I am tuned out now. I'm, I'm, I'm turning down the volume. Um, my, my hearing aid or my hearing device, my AirPod or whatever, I've, I've turned it off. I've heard so many messages on Romans 12, 1. I don't need to hear this one again. And I know you're not saying that. You're laughing. You don't, you don't believe that way. If you weren't hungry for the word of God, you wouldn't be here right now. And you wouldn't be watching on live stream if you weren't hungry for the word of God. I have three outlines just that God has given me on Romans 12, 1. They're all different. So, and I have a feeling that the more I keep going through Romans 12, 1, I'll get more. I've read through Proverbs, uh, thanks to a challenge from a Bible teacher when I was in high school, I've read through Proverbs over 500 times. Um, guess what? I still have a lot to learn. <laughs> That's after 500 times. That's because this book, brothers and sisters, is an inexhaustible well of living water. And we can never make it run dry. Uh, we can study the Bible for uh, an eternity of lifetimes and still not exhaust what is in there. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And if you would stand, I know it's going to be just one verse, but if you would please stand. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, I do have it memorized, but I'm going to open my Bible anyway. <clears throat> and um, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Please be seated. Tonight we're going to look at a living sacrifice, a loving sacrifice, and a logical sacrifice from Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> I won't go into great detail on the story, but, and I'm not doing this because a uh, pastor is a, a, a chaplain, a military chaplain. Uh, I use this wherever I go. There is a Medal of Honor recipient that I got to meet. He is in heaven now. He, cancer took him at age 72. He was the chaplain for all the Medal of Honor recipients, all, all those. And uh, he was in special forces in Vietnam and working the mountain yard people deep in the mountains of Vietnam. And he was medical corps. And there were uh, special ops who were training the few hundred people in that area to resist the North, uh, the, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese. They were stubborn. Only about four or five hundred who could actually fight. Teenagers and men who could fight. And they resisted. Well, the North Vietnamese had had it up to here and then. So 10,000 North Vietnamese came to assault their little fortress. Now, do the math. 10,000 as opposed to 500. See how that works out for you. All right. You can imagine what happened. Gary was, his job was to take the wounded and get them down underneath into the medical bunker so they could be cared for. And Gary did that. Now, while he was doing that, he had a 14-year-old boy, actually two teenagers who just loved him. And one was 14 years old. His name was Dao. He just adored, he was a Vietnamese boy, just worshipped the ground Gary walked on. Now, Gary had an enemy. 
and he had a cause. Dao had the same enemy and the same cause. And Dao stayed with Gary. Gary got wounded. And Gary kept taking people down into the bunker. Dao stayed with him. And they carried people, ca carried people, so they could get medical care underneath and have shelter. And Gary got wounded again. Uh, he took, he took uh, I think it was shrapnel, right near his spine. So he was, he was numb. He could, no longer, he could no longer carry people. What happened is that a grenade landed right near Gary. 14-year-old Dow threw his body on top of the grenade. Gary said, and, and he said more than once in his speeches, if you're a Medal of Honor recip recipient, you get some opportunities to speak. Gary said, everything he learned about leadership, he learned from a 14-year-old boy. Dow looked at Gary, saw that Gary was willing to sacrifice himself for people who were not his. Can you see any similarities between that and what the Lord Jesus Christ did? He was willing to sacrifice himself for yes, we're his creations, but Jesus is definitely set apart. He is God in the flesh. Jesus came for a great cause, Luke 19.10, to seek and to save that which was lost. Dow followed Gary's example. Gary didn't die, Jesus died. Gary didn't die, but he almost did. Dow followed Jesus, uh, rather Gary's example and became a sacrifice. He identified with the one he was following. Now, as we look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we see, first of all, that self-sacrifice is scriptural. It requires our surrendered will. So, Roman numeral 1 is scriptural. I didn't trouble Brother Vogus for another set of notes tonight because he has not been feeling well. Uh, he did, I couldn't believe, I, I, he had the notes ready this morning. God bless you, Brother Steve, and may you get a healing touch really soon. Thanks for your assistance today. And uh, by the way, thank you to all who are watching on live stream, including my sweetheart, uh, 16 hours away and 7,300 miles away. Um, Self-sacrifice is scriptural. And capital A under that, self-sacrifice requires our surrendered will. In Exodus 35, 29, the children of Israel brought forth a willing offering. Now, if you are a parent, you know that sometimes your children obey, but not so willingly. God wants us to obey, but obey willingly. He wants to give willingly. Uh, sometimes we have to teach little children to share. Uh, share? What is that? If you work with two and three-year-olds, one of the words you hear is mine. They grab, grab, grab selfishness. God wants us to be willing in our surrendered will. Romans 12, 1 says, present your bodies. This is a purposeful decision and act. We present. We give ourselves to God. It's a willing sacrifice. Let's glorify God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, our bodies are his temple. We are part of his building, correct? So since when do we withdraw ourselves? Can you imagine parts of this church saying, guess what, this church building, I think I'm going to withdraw myself from the structure. It, it doesn't happen. The builder and maker is God. And we don't have that right to withdraw. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Now, Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art the potter. We have that father relationship, but also we, are that, we have that potter-clay relationship. We are in his hands. We sing the song, Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. There's another song that says, Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, and the words say, Till my will be lost in thine. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus on his final night, not my will, but thine. Self-sacrifice requires our uh, surrendered will. It requires our death, yet rewards us with life. 
We know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we stop there. Oh, there's another verse that comes after 9. For we are his workmanship, created in, in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's why we are saved. Did I, did I lose something? I think I did. Let me try to replace this. Okay, I think that's going to work. Why have we been saved? Not to sit. No, and we've heard this said, we're saved to serve. Saved to serve, saved to serve. But you know something? <laughs> we are. And there is joy in serving Jesus. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. We, have you ever done something for someone else and gotten satisfaction out of that? Well, that's what we do when we serve the Lord Jesus. It's not logical that we should have life through death. But Jesus said, except a corn of wheat, die. Paul said, and there are different applications, I understand that, he died daily. But you know what you, know what you, uh, you and I need to do every single day is die daily. Lord, I am yours. You are my maker. You are my king. I truly want you to be my Lord. I give myself to you. I put myself aside. I want to seek your face, and I want to follow you. Use me as you will today. That's the prayer. That's what we do every single day. If you want to live, brothers and sisters, die. Then you really live. I guarantee it. Not by my words, but by his. Capital C, self-sacrifice redounds to God's glory. 1 Corinthians 16, 20, we glorify God with our body and our spirit, which are God's. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. My, aren't you a wonderful Christian? I have a wonderful God. If people see the light so shine in your life, it's because you know how precious God is. You love him. You adore him, as we, as we mentioned this morning. And you can't keep your mouth shut. Don't you love the verse in Acts where the disciple says, we cannot help but speak the wonderful things which we have seen and heard? If you're a believer and you're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't keep your mouth shut. It's just natural. It's not a rude, in-your-face presentation. It is an overflowing joy that we have when we are with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is self-sacrifice redounds to God's glory. You know what Paul said when he was weak? He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rejoice in my infirmities. What? Most gladly? He actually believed uh, Philippians 4.4 4 that says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Yes, he practiced what he preached. Let's sacrifice. Let's become weak, because in so doing, we exalt the living Christ. Do you really want to live, then die? For thousands of years, soldiers imagined a glorious death, dying for the empire. What a thing to die for. Look what you and I have to live a living death, a living sacrifice, the kingdom of God. Something that will never end. So self-sacrifice is scriptural. Secondly, it's spiritual. And self-sacrifice involves our separation unto God. Acts 13.2 tells us the disciples ministered and fasted, and then what happened? The Spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. Now, separation is not just to something, it is away from something else. Now, before I even asked Jezza to be my wife, I already knew I loved her. In my mind, I had already decided, I'm, number one, I never looked for a wife anyway. God brought us together. I did not want to remarry. But God said, I, I've got a plan for you. So, and I surrendered. But when I got to know her and I realized how special she was, there was an automatic separation that occurred 
because of the one I was adoring. The marriage vows say, forsaking all others keep you only to myself. That's why marriage is such a beautiful picture of God's love for us and our love for him. I separate from everything and everyone else and I'm separated unto Jesus. I'm separated unto the gospel. Self-sacrifice involves our separation unto God. B, self-sacrifice involves our service for God. Mark 3, 13 through 15, the disciples went forth and served. They left all, everything. Capital C, self-sacrifice involves our spirit for God. Now, this is key. It is easy, easy for us to do on the outside, but not really do on the inside. Spirit is what matters. When I'm talking about spirit, I'm talking about real love for God. And Hebrews chapter 6.10 tells us that God is not unrighteous to forget our work and labor of love. That's what counts. And that love for God is what will sustain us through the difficult times. Self-sacrifice is, excuse me, spirit is the key. We can separate in our self-sacrifice Oh, look how much I am not doing, God. I'm really a good person. I'm a good Christian. Look what I'm not doing. So we can separate from some of those bad things that you and I would never do as Christians. We can serve by self-sacrifice. You can, you can participate in ministries. But most of all, we must serve by our spirit sacrifice. Self-sacrifice makes it necessary for us to examine our hearts and our motives. How do we do that? By the word of God and by the spirit of God. We will not be known for our separation or our standards. We will not be known for our steadfastness of service. There are people in all kinds of religious groups and organizations who are very, very dedicated. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. They come to Riverside Baptist Church and they see this church family love each other and support each other. And they said, Behold how they love each other. Now, am I against standards and separation? No. Am I against service? No. But you know something? We can't lose the spirit. We can't lose that love that we have. Thirdly, self-sacrifice is sensible. Now, I used the word logical at the very beginning, but sensible starts with an S, and the other two points start with S, so I went ahead. It just makes good sense to sacrifice for God. It, it makes good sense. Self-sacrifice comes from the mastermind who is the master of logic. You know what God would say to us? Steve, sit down with me and let's talk about your, your level of sacrifice. I am the maker, the creator. I am your redeemer. I am your master. How's the sacrifice coming? Look what I've done for you. I come down, I reason, and God comes down, I reason with him. That's from Isaiah 118. Come now, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And he's talking about, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. But Jesus could reason too like he did with people when he was on earth about a number of things, not just salvation. Self-sacrifice, excuse me, capital B, self-sacrifice comes from a mind that recognizes God-given gifts. Don't you love Psalm 116, 12? What shall I re render unto the Lord for all the benefits he's given to me? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. You count and count and count. and You, you, can't, you can't keep track of all that God has done. And the psalm writer says, what can I possibly give back to God for all the good things he's given to me? That's a rhetorical question. It's impossible to really give everything back to God that he deserves for all he's given to us. But we can sacrifice ourselves. We can do that. Self-sacrifice comes from, capital C, a mind that recognizes its owner. You and I are bought with a price. We do not belong to each other. Very simple. As I said this morning, how can... How can the thing that is formed say to the potter, 
why have you made me this way? God makes no mistakes. He knows exactly what he's doing. Believers, you are part of a huge plan. We do not understand the mastermind, but we know God is good. We know God is wise. And we know that he wants to use each of us. Every person has a part. Believers, you have a part. And tonight I'm talking to you about self-sacrifice. You may say, I can't do this, I can't do that. You know what my father told me when I was growing up? Don't say I can't. Do you know what the father would tell us right now? Same thing he told, oh my, what happened to Moses? You know I'm slow of speech and so on and so forth. Ultimately, God was up, he, his angry blazed against Moses, didn't it? What happens when we make excuses to God? I can't, I can't, I can't. You can do something to sacrifice for Redeemer, Creator, the one who wants to be friend as we follow him. We can do more. Remember the story of Gary and his faithful follower, Dow? Dow surrendered his will to Gary. Dow risked his life too. The bullets were flying around all of them. The shrapnel could have hit Dow, that 14-year-old boy. But he identified with Gary. And he counted the cost. He served Gary with his spirit, not leaving his side. He served to the death, and Dow did die at age 14. Because he identified with Gary. He shared his attitude, Gary's attitude, toward their common enemy and their common goal. Brothers and sisters, we have a common enemy. He is the devil, who walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we have a common enemy, but we have a common goal. And that's to exalt him. It is to fulfill his mission. Now, Pastor mentioned that he, he, he spoke to you tonight. Perhaps God would touch you to serve full time. God is not looking for anything spectacular. He's just looking for someone who surrendered. That's all. And I want to tell you something. This is exciting. When you surrender to God and you start letting him use you, you wind up doing things that you never thought you could do. Simply because you have yielded your piece of clay into the hands of the potter, and now he can shape you. And you realize, God, look what you're doing in my life. All because you've surrendered to him. It's not because you're so, so spectacular. We are just clay. He's spectacular. He's the one. And in his hands, he can do great things. Can we do the same thing with Jesus as Dow did with Gary, who gave his all first? Jesus gave his all as the ultimate sacrifice. Ask God what you can do more in your Jerusalem. If you don't know what to do, I believe Pastor could probably give you some ideas. I believe so. Just say, Pastor, I don't know what I can do, but name me some jobs. Let's talk about some things that we can do, and I'll, and I'll do something. I'll, I'll do something. I'm sure he'll have some suggestions, and I'll have some things, and, and you'll come to a peace. I can help. I can help fulfill the Great Commission here. Um, what about your Judea? Your Samaria, uttermost parts of the, uh, of the earth. You may say, I can't go. Well, maybe you can't, but maybe you can. Just, just surrender first. Who knows what God is going to do with you? But do what you can. If you can go and surrender and go somewhere as a missionary, do it. The joy is great. 
But it's not just for missionaries abroad. It's for missionaries here. If you can't go, and you've heard this a thousand times from missionaries, you can give. Remember how I shared? The more you give, the more missionaries can do. And the more you can do here, in your own Jerusalem and Judea. You can do that. And you can pray. I want, I want you to know. And if you've prayed for laborers in Indonesia, that's why I shared that. Here's something else, and I'll close with this. When it comes to prayer, please pray. I want to tell you something. This is great. God works. There is, there's an example here. There's a pastor over in the Philippines. He does a feeding program. And I know people have been praying. There is a man whose heart was touched through one of our missions presentations. And he said, I want to give some money. And it was a large amount of money to help that pastor. This is God's timing. He is so wise. If you will pray and participate, this is the kind of thing God will do. We sent the money to him. I sent it to Jezza, and she got it to him. The pastor was in tears. His motorcycle, which was his only means of transportation, had been broken. He had to walk. Guess who was able to repair his motorcycle? Yep. There, were, there was a repair that needed to be done in the church for a long time. They were able to make the repair in the church. They are out of money to buy food for the kids. They had money. Did we know about that? No. God did. But what it took was a willing heart of someone who listened to the Holy Spirit. He was moved. He gave. Not knowing what the need was, Brothers and sisters, if you simply surrender, even if it means staying here at Riverside Baptist, and most of you will, most of you won't go to the mission field, but you'll be here, you can still pray, be surrendered, give, and then God's going to work the miracles. What can you do to surrender? And then we'll watch God work. And I can't wait till we get to heaven and find out really what's happening behind the scenes. Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Brother Labins. Let's all stand together tonight. What can I do, Pastor Christian? I tell you what, um, let me know. I can show you a list of things that can be done uh, here in our Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem. And uh, the Judea part is the neighboring communities. Samaria part is the rest of California and uh, the uttermost parts of the world. Um, it's a foreign land like the Philippines and Vietnam. But there's uh, a lot of things that we can do here in our Jerusalem. We are uh, almost ready to open up our discipleship center and uh, I envision uh, people going in there uh, throughout the week, throughout the days of the week, and we'll need workers uh, to talk to people who will uh, use that place, talk to them about the gospel, and talk to them about uh, getting baptized and becoming members of the church and discipling them, uh, things like that. So uh, that's only one of the many avenues that uh, you, uh, dear church people, can can work here at Riverside Baptist Church. There's We've been praying for workers in Adventure Club, uh, specifically uh, those who will be willing to go knock on doors and canvas uh, 3 through 11 years old um, children to come to our Systematic Theology for Kids on Wednesday nights and Discipleship Program sa uh, Sunday mornings as well. And... Um, Tell you what, there's, there's many, many things that uh, we can do here. And we need prayer warriors on Wednesday nights uh, to bring to the Lord items like uh, Indonesia um, workers there. I did not know anything about uh, that young couple uh, that you mentioned tonight. Um, the Lord uh, 
put these things together and uh, it encourages our hearts that um, he is listening and he will answer our prayers. Amen. Amen. Well, let me give you uh, the benediction for this evening and then um, you can go on and be dismissed uh, here tonight. And it comes from Romans 15, verses 5 and following. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. You are dismissed.